Okay, seeing as it is now 10, uh, we will get started with our last keynote presentation. And for this last keynote presentation, we will be hearing from some members from Neuroscience Alberta Tech UFC, who will be speaking and presenting on a variety of topics regarding emerging technologies uh, in the biotech space. And just to briefly introduce each of our speakers today, we have Joanna, who is currently a student at the University of Calgary in neuroscience. Uh, we have Kira, who is pursuing her master's in neuroscience in the Phillips lab. Uh, Julian, who is a PhD student uh, at the University of Calgary in biomedical engineering. And Dion, who is a fourth year PhD uh, candidate in neuroscience working with Dr. Adam Curtin uh, at the University of Calgary. And now I'll just pass it off to them and let them begin their presentation. Perfect. Thank you. Can everybody see these slides? I can see them, Dion. Okay. Great, so um, this is a little bit of an overview of what we will be talking to you about today. Uh, so um, I will be talking to you about non-invasive neuromodulation. Then we'll have Joanna, who will be speaking about brain-computer interfaces. Kira will be talking about functional electrical stimulation. And then Julian will uh, talk about deep brain stimulation. So I'm going to be talking to you about um, some non-invasive non neuromodulation therapies to improve outcomes for children with neurological disabilities. So who does everybody think is more at risk for stroke? Is it this elderly woman on the left or this newborn baby on the right? So most people would probably guess that it would be the elderly woman on the left. However, you are uh, your most focused period uh, for risk for stroke is actually in the first week of life. So um, in that first week of life, stroke is 17 times more common than any other point in time. And so um, even if you're an overweight smoker with heart disease, um, you're still more at risk in the first week of life than someone um, with those uh, risk characteristics. So there's different types of uh, stroke and uh, when it happens, when you are a baby, it is perinatal stroke. So the perinatal period is um, just before birth up to 28 days post birth. So it's um, seven weeks before you're born up to 28 days after you are born. And um, these different kinds of strokes can result in different injuries to the brain. So um, there are uh, ischemic strokes. Uh, there's one here shown on the left. And this is when um, there is uh, a lack of oxygen that is getting to the brain and that causes the brain tissue to, um, to die. And then there's um, other types of strokes as well, hemorrhagic strokes, that's when um, there's bleeding, which causes um, a lack of blood to an area of the brain as well, and then the, the brain tissue will die. Um, so these are the five most common types of strokes that are seen uh, in the perinatal period. And when you have a stroke, when you're a baby, this causes um, cerebral palsy. So many of you have probably heard of cerebral palsy, but probably didn't know that that is how it was caused. So it's the uh, lifelong, causes lifelong neurological disability for 17 million people worldwide. So it's quite common and it affects over 30,000 Canadian children. And so depending on how bad the stroke is or where the stroke is located, it can cause um, these different types of cerebral palsy. So there can be just one limb affected, which is called monoplegia. There can be one side of the body that's affected called hemiplegia. Uh, diaplegia is when just the lower parts of the body um, are affected. And then quadriplegia is when all of your limbs are affected. 
that's the um, most severe type of cerebral palsy. And I just wanted to show this picture so you can get an idea of where some of these brain injuries are are that lead to these different types of cerebral palsies. So um, for some of the less severe types, such as hemiplegia, where only um, there might be some weakness or paralysis in uh, one or two limbs, that usually occurs um, just on one side of the brain in the motor cortex area of the brain. So that area controls all of your muscle movements. Whereas some of these, other um, more severe types of cerebral palsy, those usually occur in the deep brain areas. So your cortex, where all of your um, thinking uh, and where those movement areas are, those um, that looks pretty normal. And it's just um, where those connections kind of funnel down, those brain connections funnel down to go to your muscles. That's where the injury is. So it um, it disrupts those pathways. And so I'm going to be focused more on these uh, less severe types of cerebral palsy where there's only one or two limbs that are affected. So mostly these ones on the left, specifically hemiplegia. So like I said, this occurs in the motor cortex area. And so the motor cortex is just, um, is in the, uh, back part of the frontal lobe. So it's shown here in purple and it has what's called a homuncular organization. And so that's when different areas of your body are represented um, differently throughout the uh, motor cortex. So areas that um, need to have more finer movements are going to have a larger representation. So like you can see your hands and all of your different fingers take up a huge part of this motor cortex area, whereas your, um, like your foot um, takes up a, a relatively small area. Same with like your, your um, trunk, or um, if you look down here, your eye. So the areas that have the most large representation are those ones that require more, um, more of those fine muscle movements. So starting with the very, the very basic stuff here, this is brains, the neurons, and they fire using, uh, or they communicate using electrical um, signals. So this is an electrical signal propagating down a neuron. And so we can um, take advantage of this um, way of communication and we can introduce um, different modulators that can promote different types of outcomes into adulthood. So if you look on this left side, when, there, when there's a perinatal stroke that occurs at birth, there are different trajectories that can be followed into adulthood that can um, result in having a relatively normal outcome in adulthood. Um, so you can have a good stroke, a poor stroke or a bad stroke, depending on what type of modulators are introduced throughout development. And so um, in our lab at the Alberta Children's Hospital, we want to really promote um, normal and good outcomes into adulthood. So we're introducing positive modulators. And one way we're doing that is through neuromodulation. And so one thing that we do is called transcranial direct current stimulation. So that's when we're putting these um, electrical or these electrodes onto uh, the scalp and they have sponges that are soaked in um, saline to increase that electrical conductivity. And depending on how you arrange them, you can either uh, excite an area so that you can stimulate it more um, or you can inhibit an area so that you can um, decrease some of that stimulation. And so some of the applications are, um, well, in, in our case, helping with motor rehabilitation, um, but they can, this can also be used for depression, schizophrenia, addiction, epilepsy, ADHD, um, and you can modulate those specific regions so that they can um, have enhanced excitability or they can um, be inhibited. 
So if you uh, put the, um, if the current is going from the uh, negative electrode to the positive electrode, that's called anodal stimulation. And that is how you can um, depolarize those neurons and you can um, enhance the excitation. So then you would, um, you would be uh, promoting um, increased activation of neurons in those areas. So um, for example, when we are doing our motor rehabilitation with some of the kids with cerebral palsy, we want to um, enhance the excitation of say, for example, uh, the hand area so that um, they can, so we can promote use of their um, weak or paralyzed arm so that it helps facilitate some of that rehabilitation. Whereas if you have the negative electrode or the current um, flowing from the positive electrode to the uh, negative electrode, then you will have, that's called cathodal stimulation and that will be an inhibitory response. So if there's an area that's really overactive in the brain, say with um, something like uh, epilepsy, for example, where it, there's a lot of excitation going on there, um, then you wanna try to inhibit some of that excitation. So you could apply um, this cathodal stimulation to try to tone it down a bit and inhibit it. And so this is um, a couple of photos from our sport camp that we do with kids that have hemiplegic cerebral palsy where they, one or two of their limbs um, have uh, some weakness. And so they do these different fine motor activities while receiving um, this uh, uh, TDCS or the transcranial direct current stimulation. And so this will be applied over um, the motor cortex region where um, to target the hand areas and they'll do activities like moving um, these little little beads from one side to the other. That's a fine motor task or um, preparing their snacks. So by doing this in combination with the um, stimulation, it can help to facilitate that rehabilitation and can um, just help with uh, the process and um, have better outcomes than if you were just doing this without the help of stimulation. We also do something called transcranial magnetic stimulation. And so um, this is based on the law of electromagnetic induction. And this can be used because all of that electric, um, the electricity from the brain signals, that's all produced from uh, different ions flowing in and out of the neuron. And so we can use different types of coils to have different magnetic fields and have different effects. You can also um, have variations in the frequencies and durations of the pulses uh, that you emit with this um, for different types of, of treatments or diagnoses. And so these are some of the different coil types. So there's the circular coil, um, which generates a diffuse magnetic field. So it'll be um, a more large magnetic field over the brain and it can activate some of those superficial cortical layers. So the cortex is the outermost part of the brain. Um, and when you use this circular coil, you can stimulate some of those more larger superficial areas. So for example, um, the upper limbs in general, rather than a specific area like the finger, like a specific finger. With this figure eight coil, um, it doubles the magnetic field. So you can have a more focused stimulation or what's known as a hotspot. And this can um, activate more of those focal neurons so that you can have accurately defined areas such as the hands. And then there is this bat wing uh, coil, which has a higher intensity field and it can get more into those deeper layers. So you can have stimulation of um, motor areas in that fissure, so in the lower limbs. Um, so if you uh, think back to this picture, you will be able to stimulate the foot and leg area, which is um, located more deeper in the brain as opposed to 
um, the hand and, and the fingers, which are um, on the more outer cortex area. So they don't need a coil that, um, they can use a coil that can activate the superficial layers. And so this is just some pictures of how that works. So you can see that circular coil, how it causes um, a magnetic field in a more diffuse whereas this figure eight coil has a more focused area coming out from the middle. And so one of the applications of this that we are using in our lab is with motor mapping to map out um, the different areas of the motor cortex. So um, this is specifically mapping out the hand area. So how it works is we have this um, TMS guided robot. That, that's what's in the picture here. And I believe this is actually the only robotic TMS machine in Canada. And so we have this here at the Alberta Children's Hospital. And uh, you have um, a 3D uh, image of an individual's brain with these different um, points that you've mapped out. And when you stimulate those specific points, you can then measure the, um, the activation in the muscle. So that's what this is showing. Um, and then you can uh, map out kind of the specific regions that are responsible for um, activating like the hand or the arm. And so that's what this one here on the right shows. So this little area right there in the motor cortex, that would be um, the hand area for a specific individual. And depending on um, like what, uh, what the individual does, for example, so if there was a, someone who um, is a piano player, um, they're using their fingers a whole lot. Um, so their uh, finger area or their hand area will be different from someone else who doesn't play the piano. And this is a video of me doing the motor mapping. So there is a pulse that's sent um, into my hand region of the motor cortex. And then you can see my hand um, uh, twitching or contracting, and that's where it kind of bounces up. And those uh, wires that are attached to the hands, those are on specific uh, muscles, and they are measuring the response in the muscle. And so um, then you can put those two together to map out where the hand area is in my motor cortex. But what do we do with um, individuals who have had a more severe stroke with a more, um, a more global injury or uh, a more severe type of cerebral palsy because these types of um, therapies aren't going to aren't going to have the same um, effect on their trajectory because they um, already have very severe um, motor impairment. So rehabilitation isn't um, going to be an option. And so we need to find another way to be able to help these individuals and be able to um, increase their quality of life and promote their participation. And so Joanna is going to speak next about brain computer interfaces. So share my screen. Awesome. Does this look okay? Um it looks I don't, it doesn't look uh like you're in presenter or that you're presenting are you in presenter mode yeah i am it might just be very laggy so i'll just give it a couple seconds see if okay. it goes i see full screen on my end 
Yeah, it might still be loading for us on this end. Okay, I'll just give it a second. Let me know when it when it appears. Hopefully the slide changes aren't this slow. <laughs> Um, maybe try, yeah. How about now? Um, it still looks the same. Okay, interesting. Maybe I will just go through the slides if it won't load. Just make them bigger. Yeah. Sure. Let me try one more time. How about oh, now? there we go. Yep, now it's working. There we go. Okay, just had to exit some of those things out. Just perfect. All right. Awesome. So yes, like Dion said, I'm going to now talk about brain computer interfaces and I'm going to be kind of talking about it in the context of BCI for Kids, which is the lab that Dion and I are in and it's Canada's first clinical pediatric brain computer interface program. And on the corner there, you can just see one of the little kids that we currently have in our BCI program and he's wearing a little BCI headset. It's going to be so slow. Awesome. So Dion already touched on quadriplegic cerebral palsy, but I just wanted to kind of bring this up again, looking at those types, this is going to be the most severe type where for an individual, they're going to likely have all of their limbs affected by this, as well as their sort of trunk and neck and head. So even sort of sitting up and having good balance and posture is going to be difficult. And they're also going to have difficulty just with voluntary movement of all parts of their body. Um, sometimes even the muscles that we need to use to be able to speak. And so they won't be able um, to use words. They'll be nonverbal as well. But despite having quite a severe brain injury, if we are looking at the cerebral cortex, which Dion was talking about as well, this is really important for things like critical thinking and problem solving, and basically any sort of conscious kind of thoughts and actions that you have, um, your reasoning, your memory. If you're playing a video game or anything like that, you'll be using your cerebral cortex, and you'll also be using it just for anything like when you get out of bed in the morning. So it's a very important brain region. And what's important to note is that individuals that have cerebral palsy, while they might look like for quadriplegia, they have quite a severe motor deficit. They do actually have a lot of intact cerebral cortex lots of the time. And this means that they're also capable of doing all of these things. It just might look a little bit different than what it might look like uh, for someone like myself who can move both of my hands and my arms and my legs voluntarily to play games or achieve any of the goals that I have. And so this is really important when we're thinking about brain computer interface technology and the fact that these individuals do have very intact, often cortexes, makes it very promising to be able to use brain computer interfaces for them to um, achieve greater independence and sort of as an access technology for them. So a brain computer interface or a BCI is going to be taking information from the activity in our, in our brain. So our neurons communicate via electrical activity and we are able to kind of detect this activity. So if we are able to process this via some form of, of measurement and look for signals within our brain activity, we can look for specific features using as you can probably imagine, very complex algorithms and machine learning techniques to be able to separate out what signals um, our brain is producing to ultimately control some sort of effect or device. Here, there's a couple examples of a computer, for example, or potentially a power wheelchair. And in this case, we are doing it with uh, electroencephalography headset. So this headset here, which I'm hoping to kind of walk 
through and show you guys a little demo afterwards is going to be recording that electrical activity uh, within the brain and through this pathway that we see up top of the signal acquisition and processing the signal features and translational algorithms is going to be able to turn different patterns of brain activity into different commands so that somebody is able to uh, control some of these devices without having their brain talking to their muscles in a really effective way like would happen in a healthy brain that didn't have some sort of brain injury at birth. So I'll just go through um, some of our program wanted to give you an overview, seeing as this is sort of technology for health, give an overview of the kinds of things that we're doing with kids in our program with this technology. Basically, we have this pediatric program here, and our mission is really just to provide access and opportunity for individuals that do have very severe motor disability to be able to interact in life in new ways and really interact with this really innovative uh, technology that has a lot of potential and really just be patient centered. There's a lot of development in terms of these technologies for brain computer interfaces, but a lot of it is um, kind of not with direct consideration for the people that might actually benefit a lot from it, as well as especially not for kids. A lot of it is done in adults. So that's the goal of our program where we currently have nine kids that we're working with uh, and a lot of kids that are sort of on the wait list, hoping that they can also come and try out these brain computer interfaces with us. So I'm gonna show you just a couple of the activities that these kids can do with the BCI. Um, this one here in the corner is just going to be playing with a toy. It might have volume. I'm not sure if you'll be able to hear it. Yeah. Yeah. So this little girl is just wearing a headset and this is how she's able to control that toy and make it spin. So you might be able to just do that with your hands, but if you don't have function in your hands, this is a very cool way to be able to control a toy. So sort of switch activated toys like that are one example of things that, in, that kids in our lab can do um, that they haven't been able to do before because of their motor impairments. We also have games. So this is um, one of the kids in our program also playing a game just online. Again, using brain commands that, that are being read by the brain computer interface. And see, she's quite happy. Some, and some other toys that we have here is we have some race cars. So this um, little kid is racing his brother with the race car for the first time using his brain switch from the BCI as well. So something fun that they're able to do with siblings and family members, potentially for the first time. And then the last thing I'll show here is just a video of um, moving a wheelchair. So lots of the kids um, are now learning how to drive their own wheelchairs. You'll see that it's pretty choppy. So it's a long ways from being you know, ready for the streets, but um, they really love to drive their wheelchairs. A lot of them, it's their favorite activity and they're using it again, just through a brain computer interface signal. It's a little bumpy. Yeah, so all of those things were done, again, with just brain computer interface controls using this headset to record brain activity and translate it to control a device. Um, and one more example I just wanted to bring up because I think it's super cool is uh, BCI painting. So we have these little kind of robot balls or spheroids, um, sphero that can roll through paint, again, using brain signals that are detected from these headsets that the, the kids are wearing. Um, and then they can drag 
the ball through paint and make all sorts of uh, fun art. And lots of these kids have won contests and awards or have sold paintings uh, for fundraisers for thousands of dollars, which is super cool for them. Um, we have one of the kids in our lab. If you're interested in seeing some more, they have an Instagram, Brain Paint by John. So you can check them out and see some more BCI painting by John. And with that, I just wanted to end this sort of formal kind of presentation with the PowerPoint and go through some kind of live demo to give you guys a sense of what the system looks like, what the setup looks like, walk through a little bit of the software. So I'll stop sharing my screen for now and share again shortly. So I'm gonna put this on myself so you'll see it in a second, but I have here one of the headsets that you would have seen on the screen and that you have seen all of those kids wearing in all of those videos. And so this is a very simple, just electroencephalography headset or EEG headset that is recording electrical brain activity. So a direct measure of how the cells in our brain are communicating with each other. Um, and then through lots of soft, so this hardware and then lots of software, we're able to take that brain activity um, into signals to control um, external devices like you saw. And today I'll hopefully play a little online game um, that you guys can see. So we have this headset and each one of these is just a little electrode here. Um, they have this inside of the electrodes, which is just a little tiny felt pad. So that's in all of these electrodes. And we have it soaked in basically contact solution. If you wear contacts or know anybody else that wears contacts. Um, so it's just a saline solution that we're really using because if we're trying to measure that electric signal, we want to make sure that it can get through where it's starting in our brain and travel through our brain, the extracellular fluid and everything, and then through all the layers of what is kind of protecting our brain, including um, our skull, which is quite a hard bone uh, for an electrical signal to pass through. So we want to make sure that the signal can get to these electrodes as clean as possible. And one of the ways we do that is by that saline solution so that we can have good um, conductance of that signal. So I will pop it on my head and then open up the software. So I soaked those electrode pads bef just before this while Dion was talking. So they're wet um, and there's 16 of them that will just be recording my brain activity. Hope it's okay with these AirPods. I'll slide it on my head and show you guys the software. I'll share my screen again. Super fun hat. It'll just be a little bit of a setup, so bear with me. Just moving some of my hair away from these electro electrodes so they have really good contact. Hopefully with my scalp through, through my hair, which can sometimes be difficult depending on how thick somebody's hair is. Awesome. So that's what it looks like there. It's pretty simple. Um, can put just on pretty quick like that. We'll go through and I'll show you sort of how you can see if you have good connection. I'll just share my screen more broadly now. And hope there's no glitches on that front. So you'll just see me, hopefully you can see this um, little app right here called Emotive Launcher. So this headset is an emotive headset. You can look them up online. And I'm just going to connect this headset here, the Epoch X. It's plugged in, it could connect via Bluetooth to the laptop or it can connect through a USB, which I have plugged in right now. And then it's gonna take you through how to fit the headset. 
Um, so if you were curious, this is kind of a commercially available headset that you could go online and purchase for yourself, as well as download all of the software that I'm I'm going to go through at the beginning here for how to set up the headset and do some training so that you can train the computer to recognize what your brain signals mean. So it'll kind of go through how to fit, how to correctly fit the headset. So I just, um, hopefully you saw, I just slid this on over my head and tried to make sure that most of these electrodes um, had good contact with my scalp, kind of pushing them through my hair a little bit. Um, there's a little band, as you can see, that's back here. So you can either have this at the back of your head or have it flipped up more so like a headband. And I'm going to leave this on the back of my head um, as shown in this picture here, but it can also go to the top of the head like that. And then it takes you to the screen where it's looking at the contact quality. So this is how well all of those little electro pads that I mentioned were soaked in a saline solution are making contact with my scalp in order to have good readings of what's going on in my brain. So ideally you would want this at 100. It's a little bit finicky sometimes and just for the purpose um, of a quick demo, it's not too important, but the better quality you have, the better reading of brain activity you're gonna have. And that means that you can have um, more um, accurate and better control of whatever device you're trying to control at the end of the day. So this is the contact quality. It shows the EEG quality as well. Um, higher is better, but this one fluctuates a lot more than contact quality. So I can close this. And so that was the emotive launcher, which is the initial software that we're using just to set up this headset, make sure everything is working. And after we've set it up, like I just did, we can go into this one down here which is where we are going to do some training so that the computer can recognize my personal mental commands. That would be different from somebody else's mental commands. The headset again, it goes through the same sort of thing, how to slide it on, the positioning, looks like the contact is still 100, which is great. The EEG quality is okay. And then this is where we want to be able to do the training for our mental commands. So how this essentially works is you can train a neutral command. So it's hard to think about nothing or kind of turn your brain off in that way, but doing something that's the same every time. So for this one, there's sort of a countdown that appears on screen. So if I try and think about, not think about anything else and just focus on this countdown, sort of count backwards in my head, head as a countdown you'll see I can set my sort of neutral brain state so that this knows what I'm doing when I'm just kind of being neutral like that and then after you've trained the neutral you can add all your additional commands so if you look at this add command here there's a ton of different commands that you can add and this is going to be making some sort of intentional intentional thought so that this headset can detect a difference in the brain activity from your neutral state to your command state. In, in these cases, I'll just train one command so we can have sort of a neutral command and um, a push or an active command. And this will allow me to play sort of simple games online that are essentially just kind of like one button, one button games that will translate whatever my push signal is into like a button press. If you can imagine that you could press like your space bar or something to play to play an online game, it will just be my brain activity that's being translated to a space bar press at the end of the day. So I'll go through what some of this training looks like from the start. So I'll be a little bit quieter here, but I'm just going to go through a few neutral trainings where I'm just going to look at what appears on screen, try and think of nothing else, and just be counting backwards from eight in my head, as you'll see on the screen. So 
So that's what the training looks like for neutral. Very simple, doesn't appear to be doing very much, but all this is doing is tracking the signals that it's getting from my brain when I'm trying to do nothing um, and just count backwards. And so this is sort of at the center of this bullseye here is where it's putting this neutral command. So I'm just gonna do a couple more of those so that it works okay when um, I try and show you guys a little game online. Two lost, one more. So, so now I have my neutral command that can hopefully be distinguished from whatever other command I'm going to enter. So a lot of the time, this is something, if you play any sports or musical instruments, um, a good thing to do here is motor imagery. So sort of imagining a movement um, without actually doing the movement. So if you play soccer, um, maybe imagining kicking the soccer ball. So trying to kind of work your brain to imagine that without actually moving your leg at the end of the day to, to move or to kick a ball or anything like that. And really the best thing um, in terms of these is just having something that is something you're familiar with. And so it's something that you can imagine consistently and accurately every time so that this computer can recognize that signal as different from this neutral command. So for myself, I'm just going to try and imagine squeezing both of my hands without actually squeezing both of my hands and hope that this can pick up that signal and differentiate it from the neutral. So I'm gonna go through that. It's a very similar training um, as you'll see, but I'm gonna be trying that mental command instead of trying to stay neutral. So now we have two dots here. So this pink red one, again, is my neutral command. And this blue one here is the kind of push command or the hand squeezing that I just tried to enter. And what this is saying is um, it is able to distinguish between these two commands, but they're still fairly close together here in terms of how different they are and how well the computer is able to classify my two different types um, of brain signals into these commands. So sometimes with more and more training, it would get better. The more you use a brain computer interface, the easier it is for you to sort of control um, your brain activity. A lot of, um, not a lot of, some people are starting to use brain computer interfaces, even just for sort of kind of meditation practices to really hone in and try and get really good control of their brain signals. Um, unfortunately, this isn't a live demo, but if this was live and a couple of you guys could try it out, you would see that it is quite difficult to try and control what you're thinking in a way that can be detected by this computer as different commands. So I'm just going to go ahead and try and enter a couple more of those. Hopefully this dot gets a little bit further out. We'll see um, how I do. So in that training, um, you could see that the cube kind of moved a little bit into the screen. And so when it's moving into the screen, that's when um, this device is recording and the computer is picking up, okay, I can tell that this is the push command um, that I'm trying to train. So that one wasn't bad. We got a little bit farther about, apart in terms of how well the computer is able to distinguish these two signals. So I'll just do a, one more of these maybe. So 
So it's giving me a 73 out of 100. So my training was okay. It could be better, but I'm going to accept it anyways. And they're about where they were. So I think it's far enough apart. Um, when we're doing this with the kids in our program, we go through a lot more training so that the computer has a really good idea of what the two signals look like so that they can have better control uh, of the games or the toys or the devices um, that, they're, that they're trying to play with. We can also go into live mode so I can try and activate it and you'll see this power meter go like it is or I can try and stay neutral. Activate it. So it's fairly good with the sensitivity right now. Another thing to note is um, this is picking up just electrical activity. Um, and we want it to be picking up electrical activity um, from my brain um, or from anybody's brain who's using it. But just because these are electrodes, so they're measuring any sort of electrical activity. Um, it can also be measuring uh, the activity of my muscles if, because some of these electrodes are sort of like on my forehead here. So if I move my muscle a lot, it might pick up that because the muscle, um, the brain, the cells in the brain, the neurons communicate with the muscle via electricity as well. And even something like eye movement. So if I'm moving my eyes around a lot or blinking a lot, this electrode, um, these electrodes might also pick up that electrical activity. Um, rather than the brain activity. So that's sort of why I, I try and be still um, when I'm doing the neutral and, and trying to do my command just from the brain activity. So what I showed you so far is online software from Emotive that you can download um, on your own. And the next thing I'll show you is something that uh, an awesome software technologist in our lab developed um, called the Games Hub that she developed so that kids could play um, some online computer games just off kind of regular kids game sites, but using a BCI instead of potentially a, a keypad. So this was um, something that was designed um, within our lab, which is really cool. As a similar sort of look, we just need to connect the headsets and choose an account. And then it lets you select an, a command. In this case, I only trained the one command, but if there was more commands, I would be able to select any of those. And then we can put this live bar on here so you can see, again, my sort of brain activity. So if I try and go neutral, I can bring that all the way down to zero with just trying, trying to think about it a little bit, um, but it will be going off as I'm kind of talking here. And this can connect to these online games. So this is just a site called Help Kids Learn. This is games that anybody can go and play. Um, you could look it up on your computer, but I think you do need a, an account as well. And these are um, different sort of, lots of them are sort of um, educational games, but there's a ton of different types and we use them on here to help kids get good control with this headset in terms of trying to stay neutral and knowing when they need to activate the device. Um, to either make a move in a game or hopefully down the road, like you saw, activate their power wheelchair, which you can imagine takes would take a lot of um, precise activation and um, inactivation so that they could adequately control it if they were driving it themselves, um, or that could be pretty dangerous. So this is sort of the starting point. Um, I'll try and go through this game just to give you guys one last one little taste of kind of what it looks like. Um, I know you're just watching from computer screens, but essentially I'm going to be playing this game where I'm gonna have little gophers come down this drain pipe and I'm gonna try and hold my neutral command the whole time. And every time I activate um, with my push command, this little newspaper is going to hit the gopher or nothing if there's nothing there that comes down the drain pipe. So I wanna try and keep neutral for the whole time until I see a gopher and then I wanna try and activate it and then immediately turn it off once I hit that gopher. Um, might seem very simple, but can be quite challenging. So we'll see how many gophers I can hit. So on this site here, um, really cool site, you can go on and play games. And for us, there's a few different settings that you can select in terms of um, how you wanna play your game. So 
um, if I was just playing this online or if you were playing this online, you might just select a mouse. So you can use your computer mouse and just select your button when you want to, in this case, hit the gopher. But for ours, we're going to use a one switch because um, this is going to come from the BCI. Whenever I activate past the threshold bar, it will send the command basically like a button press to this game. So I'll play the game, turn on, and do my best to stay neutral. I'm going to exit out of that just a little peek. So as you could see, if you're watching sort of the game and this live bar on the side here, um, the beginning was pretty good. There's some sort of like activations here, but it was pretty good at staying neutral. Sometimes the newspaper would swing when um, there was no gopher there. So that was um, me not being able to very accurately control the brain information. One, because I don't actually wear this headset quite often. It's the kids that are the experts. And two, um, just because I didn't do very much training, so the um, kind of differentiation and how well the computer knows my two different com commands could be better as well. Um, and at the end there too, so you can sometimes get activation when you don't want activation, or sometimes it stays neutral and you're trying to activate it. Um, but for whatever reason, that brain signal that you're generating is not being, um, is not the brain signal that the computer knows as your command. So hopefully that was just a little taste of some of the software um, and the hardware that you can use. It's pretty simple commercial hardware. Obviously, you can get a lot more intense than this in terms of the way that you want to measure the brain activity, and you can control a lot more advanced devices than just this computer um, simple computer game that I showed you guys. Um, but hopefully that was interesting. Um, I know this is sort of like a tech conference and there's tons of tons of space in the brain computer interface area for technologists. As you can see, this was developed by a software technologist and um, also need good hardware. Um, so with that, I will hand it over to Kira, who is going to talk to you guys now about functional electrical stimulation. So a little bit of a swap. And I'll stop sharing, Kira. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. Give me one second. Yeah.
Okay, can you guys see the slides? Yeah, it looks good. Okay. Um, okay, they won't let me full screen it for some reason. Um, okay, but you guys can like clearly see the slides, right? We're good. Yeah, it looks it looks very full screen. All I can see is oh, the, does it? Okay. the top, but it's very full screen. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Cool. All right. So um so I'll be talking first. Um, so I will be talking about functional electrical stimulation. Uh, I'll start by describing kind of what it is, introduce it, and like give sort of like a clinical context um, for it. So I have a video here that I really liked, and I'm just going to hopefully the audio works. Okay. Oh, here. Can you guys see the video? Can yes. you guys see it? Okay, perfect. Just double checking. I can't hear anything though. Oh, is there no audio? Oh, gigs. Um, maybe if I play it within the setup, should work. Can you guys hear it now? I don't think so. Um. Okay. Um. What if I just open it up in YouTube? Would that like work better? Yeah, I think so. I think that's what Sunny suggested as well. Oh, okay. Oh, no, this isn't being advertised. Okay. Okay. Hopefully you guys can hear this now. So don't think we can hear it. The only other thing I would say is potentially maybe you can just audio it. Or if you share screen, did you click the button that said share for audio? Because sometimes, sometimes that if that's not clicked, it won't, won't go. Okay, let me try to. Okay, so this should work. Can you guys hear it now? No. No, okay. Um, <laughs> okay, technical difficulties, sorry guys. <laughs> uh, not sure how I can. If you, if you stop, do you know, like when you hit share screen on Zoom, then you can mm -hmm. make sure you click that button that says share audio. Did you click that oh, button? Oh, I see what you mean, okay. This should definitely work now, like 100%. Ready? Okay. George was a happy retired family man. Good. Working in his garden gave him great joy. But everything changed overnight. He suffered a totally unexpected stroke. After a long time in hospital, George had to relearn many tasks. Talk, swallow, grasp, and even walk. George is training hard. Nevertheless, for walking, he relies on the stick and the help of his wife. This is mostly the result of him suffering from drop foot. What does this mean? A bleeding or blood circulation disorder occurs suddenly during a stroke. This results in the oxygenated blood supply to the brain getting interrupted. Often, one side of the body is weakened or paralyzed, making movement and walking difficult. Persons affected with drop foot often have to swing their hip in order to bring their foot forward. Walking on stairs or uneven ground is particularly a challenge. This makes it necessary for the person to concentrate fully on walking, but still occasional falls lead to lost confidence. Therefore, many choose to stay at home and avoid meeting up with friends, shopping, 
or simply enjoying life. Fortunately, there is something that could help. Functional electrical stimulation. Normally, the brain controls the muscles and our movements effortlessly. After a stroke, a part of the brain is damaged and in many cases the signals no longer reach the relevant limbs and the muscles cannot move. Functional electrical stimulation, commonly called FES, is a remedy for this situation. Movement and walking becomes possible again. Stroke patients can now use this principle in everyday life. For example, when using MyGate. The device can be applied independently and with one hand. MyGate consists of three components. The heel switch, which is worn in a special sock, the cuff with the stimulator, and the remote control. When the person concerned lifts the foot, the heel switch sends a wireless signal to the stimulator. This activates the muscles that are responsible for lifting the foot as one takes a step forward. Thus, this person can walk actively again. Actigate is based on the same principle, but it is less visible, smaller and more comfortable to use. Actigate consists of four components, a control unit which is usually worn on a belt clip, an antenna, an implant that is inserted by the surgeon in the thigh, and a heel switch. When the person concerned lifts the foot, the heel switch sends a wireless signal to the control unit. The pulses are transmitted via an antenna to the implant. As a result, the excited nerve activates the muscles and walking can become faster or easier. George is happy that he has chosen my gait, as he seldomly stumbles now, walks with confidence and can meet his friends. A tingling sensation on the skin assures him that my gait is stimulating his muscles. George is looking forward to daily gardening again. For further information, please visit dropfoot.co.uk. Okay, so um, I hope you guys liked that video. Um, it it kind of uh, oh, here's my no oh, okay here it is. Um, it was really good to give kind of like a clinical context for FES and as to like you know where it can be used and stroke is one of the biggest um, sort of areas in which FES is used. Uh, so here I just want to give a brief history, um, like a really quick, a really quick just like rundown. So electrical stimulation has been utilized as far back as like ancient Egypt, um, when it was believed that placing torpedo fish in a pool of water uh, with a human was therapeutic. Um, so FES, which, you know, involves stimulating the target organ during a functional movement, um, was initially referred to as functional electrotherapy, but in 1967, that term functional electrical stimulation was coined. And so the first commercially available FES devices treated uh, drop foot or foot drop uh, by stimulating the perineal nerve during gait. So in this case, there's like a switch located in the heel um, end of a user's shoe, and you would activate a stimulator worn by the user. But um, in order to like understand FES a little bit better, we have to understand what's happening um, on the cellular level. And remember, this is just one type of neurotechnology that is employed in the clinical setting to help with rehab. And there's um, other different ones that you know we've talked about uh, before me and even after me, Julian's gonna talk about a different one. And so all functions that are performed uh, by the nervous system from a simple motor reflex to more advanced functions, like making a memory or like a decision. They all require neurons to communicate uh, with one another. Um, humans use words and body language to communicate. Um, neurons use electrical and chemical signals. So one neuron usually receives and synthesizes messages from multiple other neurons before making the decision to send the message on to um, other neurons. And so here we can see that the cell nucleus is responsible for 
synthesizing input from dendrites and deciding whether or not to generate signals. So following um, a stroke or a spinal cord injury, for example, uh, muscles become impaired because motor neurons themselves no longer receive uh, sufficient input from the central nervous system. So this is where FES comes into play. So again, uh, just as like a recap, FES is a technique that uses low energy electrical pulses to artificially um, sort of generate body movements in people who have been paralyzed due to injury um, of the central nervous system. So more specifically, so FES can be used to generate sort of muscle contraction in otherwise like paralyzed limbs to produce functions such as grasping, walking, bladder voiding, standing. And so uh, this technology was originally used to develop neural prosthetics that were implemented to permanently substitute impaired functions in people with spinal cord injury, head injury, stroke, other neurological disorders. And so a person would use the device each time they wanted to generate a desired function. This picture here is a very simplified picture. It illustrates motor neuron stimulation. And so the cell nucleus, um, again, you know, is responsible for, and you can see it in A, is responsible for synthesizing input from the dendrites. Once you have an injury, such as a spinal cord injury or like a stroke, the muscles are impaired because the motor neurons no longer receive sufficient input. So the dendrites are not getting um, any input from other neurons from the other in the central nervous system. In B, uh, at B, we see the FES system, which is going to inject electrical current into the cell. And at C, we can see that the intact but dormant axon is going to receive the stimulus from the FES and propagate a signal down the axon. And this is called an action potential. And D is the neural muscular junction. So this is where the neuron connects to the muscle and tells the muscle to contract uh, or relax, depending on if the signal is excitatory or inhibitory. And so at E, we can see that the muscle fibers contract and generate F uh, muscle force. And this is just like a jet, like the overall uh, sort of, uh, cellular level preview for FES. Next, we're going to talk about um, sort of another example of FES, uh, epidural electrical stimulation or EES uh, for spinal cord injury. And we actually do this in the Phillips lab. Uh, so we do this um, for, we're actually doing a clinical trial for this right now. So it's, uh, it's really cool. Uh, so here's the, like the theory behind it. So in panel A, we can see descending sympathetic pathways from the RVLM, which is an area in the brain which helps control blood pressure. And this is an intact spinal cord and you get really uh, good healthy action potentials in your sympathetic circuitry. So that allows you to control vascular tone, so vasoconstriction and your blood pressure. In panel B, we see interrupted descending sympathetic pathways due to a spinal cord injury. So you have very few uh, preserved descending sympathetic fibers that are crossing the site of injury, and you can't get good action potentials or uh, you know, generate good signals in the sympathetic circuitry below the level of injury. So you can't vasoconstrict um, your arterioles. Uh, and then panel C, we see the epidural electrical stimulation in play. So it can help increase the resting membrane potential for uh, to, in order to fire an action potential. And so basically that just means it's easier uh, for the neuron to fire the action potential. Uh, it doesn't have to, it doesn't need that much input to get there. Uh, so once it reaches the threshold, it, it's on its way. And so here, so below the level of injury, the epidemiological simulation can help generate proper action potentials. And so you can now restore control of your, uh, you know, vascular tone and of course, your blood pressure. And so here we, this is an application for humans. So uh, when you have a spinal cord injury, orthostatic hypotension, which is just uh, periods of very low blood pressure is very common. Um, people with spinal cord injury can have that happen to them, can have that happen to them uh, approximately like 11 times per day even. 
it's like it's it really reduces the quality of your life. Uh, so here we can see how electrical stimulation can help with their orthostatic hypotension and regulate their blood pressure. So in panel E, we see a computational model of the human participant. And so here they implanted the epidural electrical simulator at, from T11 uh, to T13 sort of segments. These are called hemodynamic hotspots. And basically these are just a neuron rich areas where you get the best responses to control blood pressure. Um, and then in panel F, they did a tilt table test, which is uh, where you can induce orthostatic hypotension in the patient. And um, they, tr they turned the epidural electrical simulator on and they saw blood pressure uh, stabilize at healthy levels. So just showing that it works, um, which was a, which is a huge win because uh, blood pressure like instability can lead to other cardiovascular diseases and it, is, it, um, it really improves their quality of life day to day. Um, but yeah, and then just like to finish off, there's other applications of FAS. Uh, there's definitely more than this. I just wanted to touch on two examples. So multiple sclerosis and cerebral palsy. So in multiple sclerosis, uh, FAS again can be useful for treating uh, foot drop or drop foot uh, similar to stroke. And in the cerebral palsy, you have, um, you have FAS treating sort of the symptoms and then you can see improvements in spasticity mobility and even balance. So FES is, uh, is a really cool and it's been be being applied to many clinical contexts. And um, I think everyone's just trying to sort of make it better. And it's one of um, just one of a, another neurotech that is uh, just kind of like taking over the field. And yeah, that is it for my part. Um, I can stop sharing my screen now. Okay. And I think Julian, you can take the lead for the last part. Hi everyone. I'm another PhD student in the same lab as Kira. Um, so I'll be talking a bit about, um, I guess, deep brain stimulation and other uses of more invasive um, neurotechnologies. So here, sorry, let me share the screen. Okay, awesome. So um, I guess uh, here we have Parkinson's disease, which is a brain disease that kind of causes uncontrollable movements like shaking hands, which are referred to as tremors, and it, you know, also have difficulty moving. And one of the reasons for that is you have a part of the brain called the basal ganglia, which is kind of where movement is controlled um, from the brain to the rest of the body. And the neurons in that part of the brain um, start to get damaged or have impaired activity. And as a result, it becomes quite challenging for these people to you know, hold a cup of water or to be able to walk even. So, uh, you know, in the past uh, few decades, they had a really huge success in creating a drug called, or sorry, a medication called levodopa, which uh, can be used to treat Parkinson's disease. Um, however, it becomes less effective over time as people need higher and higher and higher um, dosages for their prescription in order to get it to work. And this led people to kind of explore other options for treatments. And one of those, is a neurotechnology called deep brain stimulation. So deep brain stimulation has been used uh, quite commonly for Parkinson's disease. And the kind of idea is you have these electrodes that are implanted inside the brain um, and it's called deep brain because the basal ganglia where these electrodes are trying to reach are, is quite deep in the brain. So it's a very, uh, very nicely named, uh, I guess, neurotechnology. And the idea here is we use high frequency electrical stimulation to try and disrupt this abnormal activity um, in Parkinson's disease. So the DBS kind of implant has these electrodes, which are these really, really long metal tubes. And then that have some small uh, portions at the end where you can send electricity to areas, you know, near those uh, parts of the, this implant. And then they have these uh, other portions of the implant uh, called a power module and pulse generator. And this basically is kind of the battery and controls these stimulations. So, um, sorry, yeah, uh, let me see, it should be a video here that 
kind of shows what happens before we use deep brain stimulation. And then after deep brain stimulation, we can see that like there's a really huge success in being able to control, you know, coordination as well as not having shaking hands, walking easily. Um, you can watch that video again, sorry. Um, and it really is doing quite a, a fantastic job at helping people regain their you know, quality of life and regain their movement successfully. So with the success of kind of deep brain stimulation in Parkinson's disease, people are starting to get really interested at seeing if it can be used for other diseases. And currently there's quite a bit of ongoing interest in research to look at how deep brain stimulation can be used to treat uh, depression or obsessive compulsive disorder or OCD, as well as epilepsy and schizophrenia. So it's a really, really exciting area of research. And it's really one of the huge breakthrough successes of, of neurotechnologies. There's also a couple of other implanted brain computer interfaces that personally I find quite fascinating. And one of them being uh, the ability to convert brain activity into words. So this is a study done at the University of California in San Francisco, um, where they implanted kind of this uh, electrode array inside the brain. So you can kind of imagine that each one of these little metal spikes are what a deep brain stimulation electrode looks like, just much smaller and sticking near the surface of the brain. And kind of the big picture overview for this is that we look for useful signals in the brain that we can convert into something meaningful using machine learning. And then with that, um, we can predict words from brain activity. So I'll play another video here that really shows what this research has done. So it's really been a huge success as far as, um, you know, implanted neurotechnologies go. And they're really starting to consider how this can be used, you know, for other types of treatments, um, especially with paralysis and, um, you know, maybe a prosthetic hand for an amputee. So people are really excited about this field. And then, sorry. Finally, I believe the same lab did the exact same thing. Uh, same idea, but converting brain activity into handwriting so people can think of, you know, a letter and then convert that, um, you know, to the computer so that they can type, uh, you know, essays, albeit very slowly, but just using their thoughts, which I think is really, really cool. So I guess that's kind of everything I wanted to talk about. And if there are questions, I'm really happy to answer. Yeah, I also just wanted to add, just because of the format, I'm not sure about um, like where the questions would come in or if people have questions or not sure how to ask. Um, I'm happy to provide my email, Sunny, if that if that works and people are, well, people can definitely send me an email um, about anything in the presentation and I can kind of pass it along to the relevant people. 
if there was any sort of burning questions about getting involved in like the neurotech kind of field. Yeah, that would be great, I think. There's a question in the chat, Julian. I can tackle it unless you want to take a stab first. Um, yeah, I can go for that one. So I guess uh, one thing that people are really starting to be interested in is converting brain activity to different, I guess, you know, let's take the instance of a robotic hand. So, you know, people want to think like, okay, you know, my hand is like this, I now want to go and grab, you know, this cup of coffee. So you can think, you know, the robotic hand can adjust and grab it like you like someone who doesn't have an amputation would normally do that. Um, some other fascinating research that um, I believe was published, you know, very recently was actually sending information back to the brain. So they were able to get someone with a robotic hand to be able to distinguish different types of materials. Um, so for instance, they held like a rubber ball or, um, you know, a piece of wood and they were, you know, blindfolded and they can tell which material it is, which is mind blowing to me. Yeah, I don't think I have too much to add to that. I think a lot of that sort of control of robotic arms and limbs and stuff like that is very much so in the invasive brain computer interface space right now, because you need very highly precise in terms of the space it's coming from the brain and the time it's coming from in the brain to be able to control those devices accurately. So hopefully we make some progress with non-invasive um, for those types of things as well. But right now it definitely has to be like very local towards the part of your brain that's controlling your hand, for example. And then that's how you can control a robotic hand, which is beyond cool. And I think honestly, the sensory stuff that Julian mentioned is maybe even cooler than that because that just, I don't know, it seems way more difficult <laughs> to have the integration piece. Okay, I don't think there's any more questions at the moment. So I think we can probably end it off here. Uh, if the participants or whatever have any uh, further questions, uh, I'm sure they'll be able to send it uh, send it over later through email. Um, I did I do believe Akshat provided me with all of your emails, so I'll make sure to pass that along to any attendees who do have questions. Uh, but other than that, thank you guys so much for uh, presenting. It was a really really uh, interesting presentation, and yeah. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for inviting us. Have a good day. You too.